waves spreading out equally everywhere. Electromagnetic waves from the longer wavelengths, the longer frequencies of radio waves to the much smaller gamma rays. And in the middle, visible light waves from the relatively longer red to the much smaller blue. Of course, these are not waves that can be heard, but really any waves could be translated into sound waves, but we'll get to that eventually. Synesthesia, anyone? So, sounds, particularly pitch, and we can use notes or tones as synonyms, and they can be low or high. And then, of course, we have dynamics, and they can be soft or... So around the world, in places as different as Korea, Mesopotamia, and Greece, we find an evolving tradition pretty early on of a correspondence between letter names, verbal vocabulary symbolism, and pitch. And in the West, it looks something like this. The first seven letters of the Roman alphabet become associated with pitches like this. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A. Sounds rather mournful, does it not? And indeed, we're going to learn later that this is an A minor scale. But for some reason, I kind of like this. Even more popular than that A minor early on seems to be a more positive collection which comes down to us as C major. And it sounds like this. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. Notice it's the same letter names, but just in a different order with a different emphasis. C to C is outlined rather than the A to A. Sometimes I say I'm a musician. I only spell up through the letter G, H if I'm in Germany, and I only count up to 16, maybe 64 if I'm in Bali, but that's another story to tell a little bit later. And here they are labeled on a piano keyboard. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. Any scale, a collection of notes. So the C major scale, it is major because of this kind of happy quality, but also because of a certain technical aspect that we're going to get into very soon. But it is C because it goes from C to C. And that technical aspect of the C to C does have something to do with notice that the space between C and D and the space between D and E have these black notes in between. Between E and F, no black note. And here's the vocabulary term. The shortest distance on a piano, and that is between a white note and a black note, or a black note and a white note, or two white notes without an intervening black note, is called a half step. And half steps have somehow some sort of a creepy quality. Let's take that one down a couple of octaves. The E F E F E F. We can call any scale, we can designate them by their letter names, but we can also designate them by the relationship between the bottom note and the ensuing notes. So C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, but we can also call this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and notice that this eight is kind of the same as one. If the women in a room sing this note, it will sound fairly low in the women's voices. But if the guys in the room sing this note, it actually sound fairly high. What I would like you to do, ladies, is to sing this note C. C, C. But when I sing the note, I have to actually, to match their pitch, I have to sing C. 
which is at the upper range of my voice, whereas they're actually in their lower range. If I were to do the low note, I'd be C down there. And notice, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, away. At any rate, notice this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The eight almost sounds like the one. The fact that there's this affinity, it's known as a, hey, what do you call an animal with eight legs, right, an octopus? What do you call a note that's eight steps, eight notes away from an initial? An octave. There's something very fundamental about that octave relationship, and we'll get an idea of that a little later. I've been saying later a lot, but hey, we got a whole semester, right? But there's also something very important about that one, two, three, four, five, or one, two, three, four, five, and oh, that's a nice thing about using the numbers rather than the letters, because notice, I can do uh, Mary Had a Little Lamb. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb, right? I can do it there, but I can just as well just do it here. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb, right? Same piece, but notice the, the pitches are totally different. This is E, D, C, D, E, 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 D, 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 E, G, G. The second time I did it, I'm not going to do it there. Instead, I'm going to put it up here. B, A, G, A, B, 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 A, A, A. You know, that's, that's totally different information, isn't it? And yet you know, you hear that there's something fundamentally the same about both of those things. So, since we know that the E, D, C, that's just 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 3, 3 in relationship to the lowest note, the key note, the tonic, the tone of the scale. So, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 3, 3. But if I change the key, I've now transposed that, taken all the relationships up uh, a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But now let me call that 1. 1, 2, 3. And do Mary Had a Little Lamb here. Easy peasy. 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 3, 3, 2, 2, 2, 3, 5, 5. So the efficacy of numbers rather than letter names. Some of the relationships of the numbers, the tone, the tonic, uh, to upper notes are fundamental, and there are certain kind of universals. And that's, you know, some say music is a universal language, and well, yes or no. But there are some things that are constant, no matter whether you pick up a trombone in China or in the United States or in South Africa, you're going to get the same kind of stuff through the mouthpiece. You notice I've now taken the trombone mouthpiece and I've put it into a trombone. So we had the octave. I'm going to do this from a different area. Modus operandi that seems to smile favorably on using this note as the one. Notice what happens when I play just by squeezing my lips. Well, I'm not a trombone player, what can I say? But do you notice I got some jumps? I didn't get. I just got this. I got basically one. Five, and I got the octave up. One. I wonder if I can do any higher. Let's see what. Let's see what my chances are. Wow. All right. That's enough for now, don't you think? Let's put those relationships back together in C. That would be the one, and there's the octave that you heard, right? Notice octaves sound, shall we say, the same, but different. They blend very nicely together. These also have a kind of a powerfulness, and that was when I squeezed my lips a little harder on the trombone, and I got what we call a fifth relationship, right? One, two, three, four, five. And then if I squeeze a little harder, I got this octave from where we started. This you could also say is a one, two, three, four, five, one, five. And here, notice if you if you just changed uh, and, and designated this as a one, one, two, three, four, one, four, one, four. Or if you refer back in our initial uh, designation, five, one, five, one, five, one. But notice we only have actually 
four notes there. This is called a fifth, this is called a fourth, and it's really, notice, it's actually just a fifth, shall we say, upside down. So instead of having the C down here, we have the C up there. So these are kind of close relationships. Then notice after that one, I really squeezed my lips, I got this. And that's like Mary Had a Little Lamb. Mary Had a Little Lamb. And notice how cheery Mary Had a Little Lamb is. That third relationship is a kind of a happy third. Notice, we talk about these half steps. There's a half step here. Notice how different Mary's little lamb sounds if instead of using this note to begin the melody, I just go down one. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. Mary had a little lamb. And we had her for supper as lamb chops. Oh dear, no, no, terrible. So in a sense, that's another fundamental principle. Change one note, and you change an awful lot. And let's back up and notice some other relationships here, too. That the fifth is kind of a fundamental universal that you hear around the world anytime anybody plays uh, a brass instrument, if you will, a metallic buzzy, buzz your lips instrument, and you're going to sound that. So wherever you are in the world, people hear that as a kind of a universal, ancient, shall we say even holy sound, because a lot of times people think ancient, they think of, you know, gods and mysticism. And notice also that this, the upside down fifth, that's the fourth, still sounds very powerful, and that this sounds pretty happy. We've already noticed that a half step can kind of sound creepy, how is this for a certain kind of creepy sexuality coming down half steps? Very interesting. That's from Carmen. She is one dangerous woman. But there's time to tell about that, too. So, we'll just say, this is what's known as a major third. It corresponds to three notes with two full steps used. And this is still three notes involved in the whole interval, but a considerably more somber quality, the sad minor third. So happy sound and sad. And that's actually going to be the difference, one of the fundamental differences, at least, between the major and the minor. Okay, I think that's probably enough for us to take another listen and look at Also Sprach Zarathustra, Thus Spake Zarathustra, Thus Spoke Zoroaster, the Richard Strauss opening two minutes of a much larger work. We'll now see it instead of the Stanley Kubrick 2001 A Space Odyssey vision, which was a little obscured anyway, wasn't it? We're going to hear this now with a full symphony orchestra. It's a giant assemblage of instruments, and we'll talk a little bit about it as it goes along. Okay, we start out with a low C drone sustained on string basses, tremolo. They're moving their bows very fast, back and forth. There's also contrabassoon and organ in the mix, and now trumpets. And they're on CGC 151. And then we have the big happy three to the sadness there with a full orchestra, and it's very loud. And then the timpani with the Five one, five one, five one, slowing down. And then, hey, we've heard that before. That is the opening trumpet mode. So we'll call this like a first little melody. And now, the full orchestra again on that secondary melody, but now it's sad, happy, and let's call this a C theme with the timpani coming back. It always kind of slows down tempo-wise. Hey, there's the trumpets again a third time on little ID, on little idea A, and now this is E, F, maybe even more positive. The full symphony orchestra really takes off at this point. We don't go back 
to that timpani, the kettle drums, the tuning drums, but lots of trombones descending. And now, every time the note has been long, long, very long, and now it's A, B, C, with a big cymbal at the end. Oh, and there's things to talk about in terms of the kind of instruments we've heard, like the bass drum and the organ holding until the end.